A Night at the Roxbury came out in 1998, and honestly, that's a little late for me. I don't usually talk about movies that came out that late, but it is a 90s movie, so technically it qualifies. Now, when this movie came out and when they had the SNL skit, it was a huge hit. You couldn't go one day without hearing that song or seeing somebody doing the head thing or the what's up. But like every other fad, people quickly forgot about it and it just went away. Now, although it is a little dumb, I still think it's a pretty funny movie. It's got some funny parts and it's got a lot of locations around Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, and even the San Fernando Valley. So I thought it was worth taking a look at. So slap on your best club and clothes, because today we're taking a look at filming locations for A Night at the Roxbury. Let's go see what we can find. During the opening credits of the movie, we get some shots around Los Angeles. We also get a very blurry shot of Sunset Boulevard near Crescent Heights. We then see the two brothers inside of Billboard Live, and I do believe that was actually filmed inside of Billboard Live. It appears to be the interiors of that club to me, which used to be located right here inside of this building. Now they do this really weird thing in this movie where they'll show the exterior of one club but say that it's a completely different club. Then they'll show the interiors of that club and say that it's somewhere else. I'm not really sure why they did this but I'm sure they had their reasons. But this is one of the few times in the movie where they say that they're somewhere where they actually are. They really are at Billboard Live in the beginning of the movie. However, the exteriors of this club were used for something else. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, just a few moments later, they get thrown out of Billboard Live. That was actually filmed less than a block away at the Roxy. Now, this is kind of weird for a couple of different reasons. For one, the Roxy is a really famous club. And you can see the Rainbow Restaurant that's right next door to the Roxy. You can see that in the shot when they're getting thrown out. So anybody that knows anything about Los Angeles nightclubs knows that that's the Roxy, that it's definitely not Billboard Live. Also, the inside of the Roxy looks nothing like a dance club. So again, not really sure why they used this location. I'm sure they had their reasons though. And just to give you an idea of how close together they actually are, here's the entrance to the Roxy, and then right here, this building, that was Billboard Live at the time. So when all else fails, they head over to the Mud Club, which in real life was a place called Moguls, which used to be located right here. It's this building just behind this dumpster. Now the front of the building has been remodeled. They've changed some things. They added a section to the top left side of the building, but you can still match up some things like this lamppost on the right side and that building on the left, which you can see just a little bit of in that scene. They're now all of a sudden on Ventura Boulevard in Sherman Oaks, and you can see the old Tower Records, which used to be located right there on the corner. Unfortunately, it's been gone for many, many years. However, the sign is still there. I mean, not the actual Tower Records sign, but the frame is still there. It even still has the light bulbs underneath. And then across the street, you can see the sign for uh, Tower Video and Books, which is this one right here. It's now Buffalo Exchange, and there's a tree that's kind of blocking it, but if we walk over this way, you can see that sign's the same too. It also still has the light bulbs going around it. So this right here was Tower Video and Books, and that right there was Tower Records. Now for the movie, they're actually filming it a lot further back because you can see this fire hydrant and this lamp post in the shot. I just decided to show it to you from further down that way because I didn't want all these trees to be in the way, but this is more of the proper shot. Now this is the scene where they're driving down the street and they're not paying attention to the road and they end up getting pulled over 
and they actually pull their car over right about here. You can see this shopping center across the street from them. You can actually see that pillar and that brick pillar while they're getting their ticket. And this shopping center really hasn't changed since the 90s. I remember that Noah's Bagels and that Jamba Juice. There also used to be a Moby Disc in this shopping center. Unfortunately, that's not here anymore. But for the most part, the shopping center still looks the same. They eventually make their way over to the Roxbury, except for the club that they use for the exteriors of the Roxbury is actually Billboard Live. They head right to the front of the club and they're met by the bouncer who is played by Michael Clark Duncan. He would have been standing right here in front of this elevator, which takes you to the lower level, which is usually used for VIP and private parties. Of course, the bouncer doesn't let him inside the club. No matter how much they try and sweet talk him, he tells them they can't come inside. But that's about the time that Richard Grieco pulls up in front of the club. He pulls up right here, basically right where this car is parked. And Doug and Steve are blown away. They can't believe the star of 21 Jump Street is standing right in front of them. And when Grieco gets out of the car, you can see these buildings across the street. So after Doug and Steve's exciting moment of seeing Richard Grieco, they head to the back of the line where they repeatedly tell their story of the time that they saw Emilio Estevez. I was like, Emilio! <laughs> They're finally about to get to the front of the line and that's when the bouncer comes out and says the club is closed, thus ending Doug and Steve's night. So Doug and Steve are walking down Holloway Drive away from La Cienega Boulevard in West Hollywood. However, this entire block looks completely different because the building that they're walking by was torn down and rebuilt. However, there's a building across the street that you can see with a pointy roof. It kind of looks like a giant triangle. You can see that building is still here. So just to give you a different perspective, they're walking down the block right here past this building, but again, not actually past this building because it was torn down and rebuilt. However, that tall building on the corner, you can see that in the movie. And there's also a 7-Eleven on the corner that you can see in the movie. Right now it's currently blocked by a tree, but if we walk down the street a little bit, you can see there's the sign for the 7-Eleven. So as they continue down the sidewalk, a pretty girl passes by, and of course they have to chase after her. And behind them, you can see the sign for Barney's Beanery. And if you look down the street, there it is. You can still see that orange and yellow sign. So that girl was standing right about here as she, uh, as she took care of Doug and Steve. Okay, so when we see them arriving at the fake plant store, they do a little bit of camera trickery. So they come down the sidewalk right here and then right there on the corner of the building, that was the entrance to the plant store. But just a few seconds before that, they were actually walking down this sidewalk. This is Holloway Drive. So they do a little switcheroo right there. And it's just a few moments later that we see them out front of the store loading up the van. And the van would have basically been parked right here where this white car is currently parked. And once again, you can see the Barney's Beanery sign down there. And while they're loading up the van, Emily comes walking out of the light bulb store that she works at, and that would have been right here. But again, this entire building was torn down and rebuilt. Also, as they're loading up the van, their dad comes out and starts lecturing them. And as the camera spins around, you can see the IHOP across the street. You first see the sign, and then the camera pans over and you see the entire building. So Doug and Steve decide that it's time to work out and they head to the Crunch Gym, which is located right here inside of this shopping center on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and Crescent Heights. Actually, I think if you look up here somewhere behind me, where is it? Oh, there it is. See, Crunch Gym. Somewhere inside of this shopping center, this is the Crunch Gym. Let's see if we can find it. And there it is, the Crunch Gym. And you can actually see that logo clearly behind them while they're working out and talking to their trainer buddy. So it's no secret that this is where that scene was filmed. So Doug and Steve decide to take a little break from work 
and they head to the beach. We see him walking along the sand in some very revealing bathing suits. And behind him, you can see the Santa Monica Pier. You can clearly see the roller coaster and the Ferris wheel. Now they are a little bit closer to the water than I am, but this shot's pretty close. And you can actually tell what part of the beach they're walking on by these three buildings right here that you can see behind Chris Catan. Of course, later that night, they head back out to Hollywood. We see him cruising down Sunset Boulevard, passing by Crescent Heights. Now that shopping center on the left side with the McDonald's sadly was just torn down within the last couple of years. So they stop their van right about here, and the way that we know that is across the street, you can see the old Tower Records, which is now the Supreme Store, but that's how we know that this is where they stop, and uh, Steve starts having that breakdown, crying about how they're never gonna get into the Roxbury, and he's having a total emotional breakdown, and Doug is trying to console him. That happens right here, across from Tower Records Sunset. Once again, they try and get into the Roxbury, and once again, they get turned away. So, they decide they need to find an ATM and grab some cash to try and bribe the door guy. We see him pass by Turner's Liquor and Tower Video, which used to be where this Chase Bank now is. They continue east down Sunset, stopping about every five feet when they think they see an ATM. And when they get right about to where this store now is, that's when they get rear-ended. So they get out of their van and they're standing on Sunset right in front of Holloway Drive and they're pretty upset about getting rear-ended but then they completely lose their mind when they see that Richard Grieco is the one that rear-ended him. So, afraid of getting sued, Richard Grieco agrees to take him over to the Roxbury and get him into the club. So the exteriors of the Roxbury were filmed at Billboard Live but the interiors of Billboard Live were used for the interiors of Billboard Live. So, where did they film the interiors of the Roxbury? Right there inside of the Mayan Theater. So thanks to Richard Grieco, Doug and Steve end up sitting down at a table with Mr. Zadir, the owner of the Roxbury, and a few other clubs. Now for whatever reason, they never used the real Roxbury in the movie. The Roxbury was a real club, it used to be located right there in that building, it later became Miyagi's, it's now the Pink Taco restaurant, but at the time, the Roxbury was a real place, it was located right at Sunset and Roxbury Road, but again, for whatever reason, they never used it in the movie. Don't know why. So Doug and Steve really hit it off with Mr. Sadir, and he invites them to go to a party with him. We see them driving in a limo with them down Sunset Boulevard, but before they get to the party, they gotta make a quick detour in the San Fernando Valley. So they're cruising along in the limo when Doug and Steve recommend stopping to get some Fluffy Whip to make the party a little bit better. So they make the assistant who's played by Colin Quinn stop at a convenience store to get some cans of Fluffy Whip and they stop at a market that in the movie is just called Food Mart. Now, when I first saw the movie, I recognized this location instantly growing up here in the valley. That was filmed right here uh, at what's now a 7-Eleven. The building has since been remodeled, so it looks a little bit different, but right inside that building, that's where Colin Quinn goes to get all the cans of Fluffy Whip, and then as they're watching him through the window, they notice that uh, he's about to use his credit card, so, Doug runs in and he grabs his credit card and uh, he stops him so that he can call the credit vixen himself. So Doug and Steve decide that they want to speak with their new friend, Mr. Zadir. So they head over to Zadir Industries, which was located right here inside of this building. Now it looks a little bit different. They've remodeled the lower half and enclosed it. Of course, there's no longer a sign that says Zadir Industries because obviously that was just there for the movie. However, you can see this lamppost in that scene. So after Doug and Steve get kicked out of Zadir Industries, they head back to their van and they're sitting there feeling a little bit down. So they decide to call their new girlfriends. 
Now during that phone call, the girls were having drinks in the pool area here at the Sunset Tower Hotel. And there it is, although the entire pool area has been remodeled, those cement palm trees that used to be connected to the wall are no longer there. All of that was replaced with this glass wall, and unfortunately, those cement palm trees are the only thing recognizable in the movie. However, when they walk out of the hotel with Doug and Steve, the front of the hotel is still a bit recognizable. Even though those glass bricks are no longer there, you can still recognize it. And as they walk a little bit further, behind them you can see a black and gray zigzag pattern. Now that's kind of blocked by a tree. However, if we look up at the hotel, there's that black and gray zigzag pattern. So they walk the girls over to their van, and behind them you can see the sign for sunset. And behind the girls, you can see the awning of the Sunset Tower Hotel. I noticed those palm trees. The awning has changed, but the palm trees are still there. And behind Doug and Steve, you can see the old West Hollywood Hyatt, a hotel with a lot of history. Uh, the hotel is still here, but unfortunately those balconies have since been enclosed. So once the girls realize that Doug and Steve are just a couple of dorks, they're out of there. And Doug and Steve no longer have girlfriends. On the way home, they get into a huge fight, probably the biggest fight they've ever got into, and it's such a big fight that Doug ends up moving out of the house and moving into the pool house. Meanwhile, Steve starts dating Emily and agrees to marry her, making his personal trainer and Richard Grieco his groomsman. Doug realizes he can't let this happen, and he shows up to the wedding, Lloyd Dobler style, holding a boombox over his head, playing that song. Yeah, you know what song I'm talking about. Steve falls for it, and Doug and Steve take off from the wedding, leaving Emily all alone at the altar. So after Doug and Steve leave the wedding, apparently they come all the way to the San Fernando Valley, and they come to the Japanese garden. Okay. It was right here on this bridge where Doug and Steve stood making up and reconnecting. And you can actually still match up a lot of stuff here, like these cutouts on the bridge. And then also that rock right there and this rock on the end of the bridge. Both of those can be seen in that opening shot. And in the close-ups, the camera would have been pointing this way on Will Ferrell. You know, some of the trees have changed. They might have brought in extra stuff, you know, to make it look a little fuller. And then the camera would have been pointing this way on Chris Kattan. And you can see just a little bit of that building behind him. So Doug and Steve are back on the scene, cruising down Sunset Boulevard, right past the world famous comedy store. And as they continue down Sunset Boulevard, they all of a sudden see a nightclub that looks a lot like the one that they pitched to Mr. Zadir. Now the exteriors of that nightclub, which I guess are actually the interiors, were filmed right here in front of this building. So Doug and Steve are walking angrily along the side of the building. There was no fence here at the time. There was just the velvet rope, because again, it was supposed to be the outside or the inside of a nightclub. And when they get to right about here, they're met by the door guy who tells them that uh, they need to be on the list. They give their names and they're surprised when they find out that they're actually on the list. So once they get inside the club or outside the club, they see Mr. Zadir, he's so excited to see him, and he asks them how they like their new club, and he lets them know that he's making them partners since it was all their idea. And while standing at the bar of their new club, Doug hears a familiar voice and realizes that it's the Credit Vixen. And lucky for Steve, the Credit Vixen's there with her best friend, Hottie Police Officer. Doug and Steve not only now have a hot new nightclub, but they finally have girlfriends and everybody lives happily ever after. That's gonna do it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.